On this week's show, we discuss the pros and cons of commercial property investing. We're going to be meeting the mother of four who managed to quit her full-time job as a nurse by successfully investing in property. And in the news, we reveal which UK city has had the highest house price growth for five years out of the last six. And it's also expected to rise by 57% by 2028. Welcome to the Property Investors Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. We're here every single Friday at 4 p.m. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss an upload. You can catch us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Enjoy this week's show and don't forget to share it with all your friends. Hi, I'm Russell Leeds. And I'm Alistair Cunningham. So, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well, my friend. I'm very, very well. Hey, good week. I mean, we've been together a lot this week. We've been at the crash course. I know this is getting too repetitive, me seeing you too much, and I'm actually starting to... Uh, Love Wow. <laughs> but yeah, what do you think of the crash course, man? It was really good, wasn't it? Mate, it was. It was awesome. If you haven't been on the crash course yet, get on. We had 811 people. It's nuts, isn't it? That is a lot nuts. of people. It's a lot I remember that, that was the biggest one by some, wasn't it? Mm. Um, and uh, there was... The, it was just... I'm glad the you just threw busy. the pen on the floor. Yeah. It was kind of annoying me the way you were clicking out. Was it? Sorry, man. Uh, you threw it away. It's great. It's good, man. It's good. It's good. No, it was nuts. It was great. And the atmosphere is just... The deals know. that they were finding, man. There were so many good deals as well. Um, people that have never invested in property or never even... Uh, before they even attended, they knew very little about property investing. They're finding property investments that are going to be bringing like 40% plus ROI. There was one lady, I think it was like 46%. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you want to come and join us at the Property Investors Crash Course, I'll be there. I will be there. We try to sell it at the moment, mate. We try to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be there. <laughs> there you go. You get, you get the hang of it now. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, investors.co.uk and book yourself on. Tickets are free. Two day event. Amazing. Anyway. This week's show. So we're going to start <coughs> off. We touched on commercial property last week. We've got commercial theme going at the moment. Uh, we touched on it last week. We're going to be talking about commercial property, the pros and cons. Um, Samuel had a sit down with a guy called James Sinclair. Now, James Sinclair uh, is friend of friend of ours, friend of mine. Uh, do you know him? Uh, no, no. Okay, he's not a friend of ours. Just just a friend of mine. Um, and he had a similar background in that he started off in in entertainment. Yeah. He built up his business in in entertainment. He, he now owns theme parks and zoos and you know and play centres and nurseries yeah, and all sorts of stuff like that. And he's done it the other way around <laughs> to what say Samuel's done in terms of he's built his business first and then he's used the business to invest in property, he's invested in commercial property. And Samuel and James have an interesting chat about the pros and cons of commercial compared to residential. So let's just hear that now. <laughs> I wanted to bring you on this discussion because you're an entrepreneur, you make a lot of money, you've invested in residential property, yep. you've also invested heavily into commercial property, yep. so I thought it would be really good to get kind of a pros and cons of commercial versus residential, also yep. understanding of what is commercial property, yep. uh, but before we do any of that, why don't you just give a little bit of an introduction to yourself and, and, and explain where you are and where you're coming from. So first of all, start off like you're doing kids parties. <laughs> Yeah, yeah well, and that is my background. Magician, yeah, Since yeah. I only did it for a few months, you did it for a very... You would not believe how many people in this industry started off doing kids' parties. Really? <laughs> so we're all magicians. In the property industry or the training industry? In the training business speakers. Well, yeah, I suppose it makes well, sense. Simon Zouche? He what? was a, he was a, he was an entertainer. Was he really? He was a magician. Yeah. So uh, I, even the Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. You know that guy started yeah. off doing kids parties. Well, there we go. There we go. So so basically, I started off doing that. Um, I built that business up. I started buying property residential when I was 18, 19, um, and I rented that out. Then I remortgaged that to build what I would call a traditional brick and mortar business. I built a children's family entertainment centre, yeah. and I started building day nurseries. And then. <laughs> That bless you. Then I open a theme park and a, and a, like a farm zoo park, and, th and that business grows today. We've got 400 staff, do about a million pounds a month in sales, uh, and that continues to run. Um, and I had some spare time. I went into schools, start teaching business and entrepreneurship, uh, wrote a couple of books. <laughs> And um, you really have got a little coldy-woldy there, Sorry, aren't you? Um, and, uh, and so then I started thinking, 
I, look, I looked at people that were doing really well in property and I realised the people that were really super wealthy didn't have flats and houses. They had office blocks and commercial property. But I also realised that it's a much higher barrier to entry. Like the I at 19 couldn't have gone and bought, you know, an office block or a warehouse to rent out. You know, it's, it's, it's much harder to get the mortgages on them and et cetera, et cetera. But I think over the long term, there's more money to be made out of commercial. Okay. Yeah, interesting. I would, I would agree with that. I mean... Yeah. When I speak to people like Lord Sugar yeah. about property, yeah. he is in, into property in a very, very big way, yeah. and he only does commercial. Yeah. But then, if 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 that had been the, the way forward, the best way forward, yeah. I'd have never got into property because there's no way. I mean, I do commercial yeah. now, yeah. but starting out, yeah, you, yeah. Where do you where do you start? Or I mean, the caveat to, to Alan Sugar as well, and, and like it, I believe it's business first, property second, because you can a business can generate so much cash flow if you get it right that you can then really grow your property empire. Lots of people think you know property then business and real or they spend so much time on their prop their property stuff they're not looking at their business enough and if you really build a business really successfully it's so much tax efficient to get wealth out of that into property i guess it depends on what you're wanting to achieve like if you're wanting to achieve serious wealth building yeah then i would agree the best strategy yeah, is to have yeah. a business that makes a lot of um, cash flow yeah dump that money strategically into yeah. property you got it that, that's that's that is the best way to make a yeah. lot of money Absolutely. Absolutely. I think if you're a lot of our viewers are starting with very little, yeah. they might be working in a, in a nine to five job, really yeah. boring, and all they want to do is replace their income. Now, to replace their income, actually, to, to talk to them about set up a business and make you a load of cash flow yeah, and dump yeah, it into yeah. commercial, actually, that that's a completely different world. So, the funny thing is, Sammy, do you know why I started out in property? So it was partly pension planning. I thought, you know, I was 18, bought my first one, and that would, you know, see me into the sunset when I got older. But I also went into property for the reason that I knew that I would buy in Essex, because I was from the southeast, sorry about that, from Essex. I would buy these and they would grow in value and I'll be able to give them to the bank as security to borrow for the business, not to buy more property. And I knew that I wanted, you know, I'll start with the end in mind, I knew I wanted to own visitor attractions. I knew it was a capital intensive business. You know, when I was 16, I knew I wanted to own zoos and theme parks and stuff like that, because it's what I loved, you know, I was passionate about that stuff. But I knew that I needed lump of capital to do that and I thought you know be a magician first learn the game you know it's a cash flow business buy some property grow the equity give that to the bank to borrow to build the capital intensive business yeah that's, and that's really smart and that's worked out really well yeah. for you and it has worked yeah but that's not for everyone like you say what what would you say then to somebody who if someone was, <coughs> if someone was just starting out and yeah. they were literally on thirty thousand pounds a year yeah. They had thirty thousand pounds in the bank. Yeah. They were working a job they hated. Yeah. Do you not think for that person residential would not be a better way to get started than commercial would be? So regardless if it's residential or commercial in that situation I would be looking for high yielding assets so good cash flow properties so whether that would be depends on where you are in the country if you could buy a building for £100,000 and turned it into serviced offices I think that would make more money than serviced accommodation in uh, the residential world Okay, but it depends where you are in the country like that is impossible to do in Essex impossible to do in London Kent and any of the home counties I've got those residential stuff yeah so, absolutely yeah yeah so so I would be looking at it on a deal basis I'd be saying right I, you know I would want you know a 20% ROI or at yeah. least on yeah. my, my money and you've been to in. my crash course right yeah I understand that the, and that's um, the stuff that I would believe and that's what I would do yeah. I would try and look for it in commercial because um, that's what I know now but back then when I didn't know I would probably just go so why don't houses. we do a list then of, of, of pros to begin with as a commercial <coughs> and then we'll perhaps look at some yep. of the cons to commercial some of the yep. pros of residential and yep. then the viewers can make their own mind yep. up okay, so go for you're it. clearly very pro commercial generally yep. so you go first and give me the biggest the single one biggest pro about commercial property so not that it should be about this but the government are not anti commercial landlords yep. but I believe the establishment are anti residential landlords at okay. the moment. So for instance, stamp duty is a lot cheaper. Yeah, so lower stamp duty, the first 150,000, zero stamp duty. Yeah. That's a huge pro. Yeah. Um, you can claim all the interest back, all the costs back, none of that stuff has been affected. But on. you can do that with residential when you're buying through a company. Yes, of course, yeah. The, I suppose, so that's a massive pro. The yields are usually a lot higher. Really? 
Yeah. Hold on as well. I, I, I was give you an example. One thing. Let me give one yeah. more thing about yeah. commercial. I don't think the yields are high. I'll give you an example. I'll right, prove we'll that talk. to you. Yeah. Um, I, I guess an advantage to commercial property would be that usually the tenants are better because they'll totally take responsibility of the whole building yeah, and property. Yeah. So rather than them bringing you and saying, you know, oh, the, the, the electricity's not working when really yeah. the light bulb is changing, you wouldn't really well, get that. Well, it depends. If you're doing serviced offices, then you're, it's the same as doing serviced accommodation. You're responsible for the building. Yeah, so but, but I, know, I guess, yeah, it depends on the commercial yeah. property. But yeah. usually the, the, you can very easily have commercial property. Some of the properties that we've got, you can just, you know, you'll have a 10-year fixed contract yeah. and they'll do everything. Unless it's... Yeah, yeah, unless yeah, the absolutely, yeah. Up, and you can just yeah. literally turn your back on it, forget yeah. about it. Yeah. And it yeah. really is passive income yeah. uh, in, in the best and purest sense. So yeah. I guess that's a good thing about yeah. commercial. One of the things that I don't like about commercial so much um, is that I think that it's it's just, it, it, I think it, it usually you need more money. Not always, but you don't see many, I don't anyway, maybe you disagree you, you with You need me. more money if you haven't got a trading business next to it. That's very important. But, but a lot of people haven't, though. So if, you, if you've no. just got £30,000 to invest, no. you're going to really, really struggle yeah. with commercial. And also... Yeah, yeah, commercial, in short form, is for people that are business owners yeah. and in proper but serious that's investors. Big, that's quite a big negative for certainly a lot of Absolutely my Absolutely it is, yeah. How much would you say you need to, to, to invest in commercial property? I know it varies massively, but generally speaking... So, so it's a, what I would say, first of all, the first commercial property anyone should buy is if they was going to go into this world, and this does answer your question, if you've got a trading business and you, I don't know, it was a fish and chip shop and you wanted to buy the building the fish and chip shop operates out of, if that's a profitable business, you should be able to get 100% finance from that just by going to a normal bank. Does that not, is that not only for certain types of businesses, though? Like if you're a, an accountant or something like that. No, no. So basically, you would so say so you would need, usually need bigger deposits for yeah. commercial property. That is also a negative, and it, you know. Yeah, you need to put at least forty percent in. No, no. If it's an owner-managed business, so if you go back to our fish and chip shop scenario, I'm a fish and chip shop owner. My business is making seventy thousand pounds a year. If I could buy it. Um, um, I don't want to put a deposit into it. I'd be going to the bank saying, look, I need to keep my money in the bank, but this makes commercial sense. It's going to improve my cash flow if I can buy it. You will lend me 70%. The government will come in and do what we call an EFG loan, Enterprise Finance Guarantee Loan, and they will lend you the deposit. So it's like help to buy, but for commercial property. Which is basically no money down. No money down, but... If you're going to be there. Yeah. yeah. They won't do it for investment purposes, but that is a really smart thing to do. So if you're a doctor, if you're an accountant, yeah, although they've always done those sorts of deals. But like for your business, you could go up to your bank and they should give you an EFG loan because it's you're employing people and blah, blah, blah for the office that you're operating out on if you wanted to buy an office. Yeah. yeah. And what I would do, it'd be cheeky, buy an office that's too big and then rent it out another couple of floors and you you know yeah. then you sort of so 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 if you're a, a, a trader and you yeah. have a business that's yeah. a, a yeah. bit of a no-brainer way to start to get your foot yeah. into the door yeah and, and a lot of uh, we've got a lot of our students that have got businesses and we've advised yeah. them to do things like that uh, where i think having just one little commercial so if you was the fish and chip shop owner and you wanted to do more residential stuff yeah if you've got one business trading with a bank you could then have a commercial bank manager that will look after you that will help you do your residential property aspirations and that's a little trick that i've definitely found that's helped me brilliant so are there any other big massive pros to commercial the ne another negative would be you, you always have to pay the capital down so you get taxed on invisible income. Most mortgage lenders want the capital pay down on commercials. So you can't do interest only. So you're paying the capital down. That looks like a profit. You've got to pay tax on invisible income, I call it. I know yeah. it's not really, but you're paying tax on the capital that you're paying yeah. down. Yeah, whereas residential, you can yeah. just wait for the property yeah. to go up in value. Absolutely, pay the absolute yeah. absolute minimum. Um, yeah. But you're, you, if you've got a trading cash flow in business, you could probably put that in the P&L of the trading business and that can be tax efficient. Um, and, you know, I just, I'd put, so that, I was thinking another pro, I think the rents are much higher. That's why as well. So can I give you, just talk through a deal. I bought, Tell me the kind of return on investment you get from commercial property. So, well, so I bought um, a property for 140,000 a few years ago and it rents for 35,000 pounds a year. Which is... Okay, that's pretty. That's pretty high. Yeah. So what's that giving you? Is that so, but what I do, what yeah. I do is I do basically a HMO for commercial. So I buy a warehouse, I put two units downstairs and three offices upstairs. Yeah. 
So then I derate it for council tax. I don't have council tax anymore because you get small business rates relief by separating the business. They're all yeah. up. So I never have to worry about business rates or council tax or anything like that. If one of my tenants go bust, I can put another one in. So basically, I've looked at the HMO model and go, I really like that. I like that that's a high yielding thing in the residential world. And I just stole that idea and put it into the commercial world. That's fantastic. So yeah. how would you go about finding a commercial property like that? So I think, not that you, I think it's finding the right locations because the you want to choose where there's a, see with residential you can sort of, everyone wants to live anywhere with the residential thing in the UK, but I think it's much easier to do those in busy towns where there is business and trading going on. Yeah. Um, but you still want to use your same ROI stuff. I've just bought a £900,000 warehouse, I completed on that yesterday, I put no money into it zero money into it. So how did you structure that? Well, the bank just went, yeah, I'll do it because it's my trading business. I'm the tenant of okay, it. Okay, yeah. And if you just, like, if you went up to the bank and said, I want to buy X property and I don't want to put any money into it, then they would say no. So if, <laughs> but if, if you're a trading business, it's that I just find if you're a trading business, you can do more in residential and everything. It's a really good thing for a property yeah. investor to have in your armory because you get to meet decent bank managers that can say, yeah, I understand what you're doing here, James. We can make a commercial decision on that. Call centre banking can't do that. What would you say then if somebody was not a businessman yeah. and they had, say, £100,000, yeah. would you think they'd be better off putting that into commercial or residential? No, I still, even though I've said all this, I would still do residential first. Yeah. Because it's a step process. You know, like I told you, I wanted to own a visitor attraction. I knew that, first of all, I need to be a magician, learn how to deal with customers on a small scale, learn how to pay bills and yeah. invoice people, make that profitable. Then I'd done an events business. I hired out equipment. Then I'd done an indoor play center. Then I'd done day nursery. Then I went for a farm part. Then we went for the theme yeah. part. There's a step process. And I, you know, you don't want to cut things out and not yeah. learn the stuff. And you know? I think that, I mean, you know, it's only in the, in the recent months and years yeah. that we've started even doing commercial at all. Yeah. I think if I'd have started doing commercial yeah. six, seven years ago, yeah. even, oh, I'm, I'm glad I didn't. Yeah, because when you're a business owner, you understand business and therefore you're going to be better at doing commercial property because it's mainly to businesses. Yeah. But when you're just an investor, it's yeah. got some cash. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think... I think, personally, if you're an employee and you're wanting to get out of your job, I wouldn't oh. even think about commercial. No. If you're a business person yeah. and, and you've, got, you're, you've got cash coming in, yeah. then you, you definitely need to look at commercial. What, 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 what could be good, though, is if you've built up a series of residential property portfolio at year 10, so you've been doing that for 10 years, yeah. you could then say, right, I'm just going to buy one building now for a million quid. And that could, if you're smart, you could do self-storage in there. You could probably bring a quarter of a million quid a year off of that. Yeah, yeah. And you could put just one person running it. But those 10, pro and you could just probably remortgage and do that. So I mean, like self-storage, I've got a client I work with that does storage, like that's hugely profitable and it's a good bolt on to it. So that could be, how you, so you could say, right, I'll buy a warehouse, I'll do storage in there. So you've got a trading business, and then you could build a commercial property portfolio off of a trading business and you can get like bank guarantees and stuff like that to build it up. That could be another way of doing it. Yeah. Well, we, there's not a lot of places where you can learn about commercial property. I mean, no. we, we focus on residential, certainly to begin with, unless yeah. you're very advanced. So, yeah, the, the big problem is, it is let, but wherever it's a higher barrier to entry, there's more money to be made. We, everything you do in life, the higher barrier to entry is, the more money to be made. Yeah. But it blocks people. So, you know, I, I don't know, give you an idea, like opening a theme park is probably one of the top things in leisure that makes money, but it's a much higher barrier to entry and not everyone can open a theme park, for example, yeah. you know? So I thought that was a... <coughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Excuse that bit of coffee woffy. <laughs> I... <laughs> I thought that was a really... Um, sneezy wheezy when it was aside, I thought that was a really really interesting interview. And also, it was brilliant. I actually that was I think that was been one of the most interesting interviews I've seen. Yeah, I, I think so seeing too. the different like the different angles from property investing. So um, you, you could be sort of excused for thinking that all everyone ever does is residential because perhaps you don't hear so much about commercial. Yeah, but uh, hearing a different pros uh, perspect perspective yeah. of it. Really good. Do you, you, really were saying, good. you were saying during it that you feel pumped to actually go and get into commercial now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've, like, commercial is something I've always been interested in and, and seen um, yeah, James talking about it so passionately. Yeah, absolutely. And um, 
there's, there's, it's, it's like anything you've got to learn about it yeah um, so what, what 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 are you going to do then what, what, what's your have you got, I mean it's interesting that we've had the two, two, two when we talked about it last week as well but um, what sort of property are you thinking of buying what 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 are you I, attracted to do you to? know I've always wanted to go back in because I remember when I was in my old business I don't want to drama on about this right but I used to always struggle with finding units and I know lots of small businesses that are all looking for like units like maybe a thousand square feet 1500 square feet there's just a very lack of demand a lack of supply there's massive demand but there's lack of supply my favorite bit Sorry. my favorite bit of the interview was when he said about copying the HMO format yeah, yeah, yeah. and moving it into commercial commercial yeah because one thing that um, I'm, I've found when I've done research on commercial is lots there's lots of small businesses that are looking for maybe up to about two and a half thousand square feet yeah yeah um, and there's not that many that want that want massively more but let's say yeah. you bought a warehouse that was 20,000 square feet and split it up into I don't know what would that be about is it eight seven uh, or eight yeah seven um, or eight seven or eight different um units Small you units. could make so much mm-hmm. so much money out of it yeah so much money out of it and, and it wouldn't even be massively massively expensive <coughs> no I, I don't think so um I, I there's lots of people doing it already though there is there's well they're not lots but there's a few people doing it already so for instance in, in Northamptonshire there's a company and they've got this massive unit and they just split it up into individual units and they're all sort of between 200 square feet up to like 2,000 square feet um, so they and it, it's, they're doing it very well very well yeah um, and I, I know if you can find if you can supply like a thousand square foot unit I don't think you'll struggle to fill that because there's lots of small businesses whether it be industrial things like that, that that would happily take them on I also imagine once you get into it and once you start learning learning the crack and how it all works it's a lot simpler to work it out because with a house you've got to take lots of things into consideration such as yeah, how nice yeah. is the street how nice does it look what mm. are the views there's lots and lots of different things that will make up the value of a house that's why yeah. you know the values change dramatically mm. whereas with this I imagine it's mainly just going to be the area but we're sort of like a warehouse um it doesn't really matter where it is, does it? No. It doesn't really matter where it is. So if it doesn't matter where it is, you're kind of just working off a square footage basis. Yeah. Which is very easy to work out how much you're going to get rent per mm-hmm. square foot and how much you're going to buy it for per square foot. Yeah. Per square foot. So you- I, I think with their units, um, yeah. depending on what type of unit they are, so if it's like a warehouse, I don't think that really matters where in the country it is. If it's like a, like a shop, obviously you've got to look at, footfalls and things like that what's going to happen uh, and if it's like a maybe a, a commercial business like say a workshop or a, well james said know. stick to a stick to a busy town a busy city, town city yeah yeah i was going to say because uh, like i say i travel around a lot uh, and you do see a lot of empty commercial units the further up north you go um it's just you do i, I i've been around a lot of these places that's so you do see that. i suppose the big worry yeah would be to buy a commercial unit and then not be able to rent, rent it out, it out. Yeah, because it's, it's obviously going to be expensive, more expensive to buy, more expensive to your cost. So if it's empty, your cost might be a little bit higher because depending on the purchase price. So. Yeah, yeah. But I, I thought it was a really interesting interview. I thought that the, the difference, they'd be very interested in, in, in people that are listening to, to this now, in, in your thoughts, comments yeah. on, on, on what you think. Um, have you ever bought commercial? Is it residentially interested in? Has this changed your opinion? Have you been residential mindset and now you're thinking... Hmm. I must admit, it's made me think. Hmm. I know. It, it I know seriously it has. has. It's made me think. Hang about. Let's have a bit of this. Um, yeah. Well, uh, we, we'll we've, see what we've been we've been doing commercial now, but not on a big scale. Okay. We're still very very heavily residential. But it, it, it has made me think a little bit. Hmm. Should we refocus? A bit? I must admit, when we were watching that video, you I did see your eyes light up at one point when he talked about the the uh, entrepreneurs grant from the government. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd heard I about think it was that. The EF, was it EFG? Or well, I didn't realize like quite how good it was. Um, like, you can buy it, commercial can, for free. If, as long as you've got a business, you can buy no it for free. Yeah. I did look into it. I remember, I remember finding out there. It's. I think it's a. a I mean, I might. I might be wrong. I might be overcomplicating it. But when I looked into it, I think it was a little bit more difficult depending on what your trade was. Okay. Well, he used it. the example of a fish and chip shop. Um, yeah. So if you've got a fish and chip shop, you can then. I don't, unfortunately. Yeah. I'm actually quite glad I don't because I would get fat. <laughs> I must admit, I actually fancy fish and chips now. Maybe, should we, should, maybe we should do that for, for mm, maybe for dinner. Okay, maybe for salad dinner. for lunch. Okay. Already. You can put that inside the fish and chips. 
True. Yeah. True. Elliot does that. He says, "I, I, I have um, he says I had, so, I had some meat and vegetables with, with, a, with a salad." And what he means is he had a kebab <laughs> with chips. <laughs> there is vegetables, potatoes. Uh, hang about, hang about. Did he have a diet coke at the end? Of course. It's good, man. It's all good. It's fine. As long as you have a diet coke, it's fine. <laughs> 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 so moving back into the, the more normal uh, residential investing yeah, yeah. and what, what we sort of normally talk about. We're going to meet a lady now. Um, she's interviewed by Samuel. She is a mother of four. Yeah. A mother of And two of those are very young, I believe. They're all under three, Because you I could think. be three a mother four. of four and have four grown-up children, in no, which case it's she's irrelevant. She's got twins, so I think they're all under four years old as well. They're four all under wrong. four. Yeah, yeah, they're all young. They're really young. So a mother of four under four, um, okay. who's... M- was Had a full-time job as a nurse. Yep, she was which a nurse. She's, she's quit her full-time job. Yep. And she's done that by successfully investing in property. Yep. She's a great lady. Let's hear from her now. Welcome to Winners on a Wednesday. I'm Samuel Leeds, and this week I have the pleasure, the joy, the honour, the outburst of bringing onto the show the amazing Anne Mather. Hello. You know what? You are an incredible human being, Anne. Thank and you. Please tell your background. What is it that you did when we first met? I was a nurse. You were a nurse. When we and first when met. When we met, you had four babies, all under the age of four. Yes. And you were working like crazy long hours. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We met, and within four weeks, what happened? I was financially free. Financially free in four weeks. That is just incredible. So let's hear the story then. So t- t- tell, tell, me, tell me what happened. Um, how did you end up at the crash course from being a nurse based in... Newcastle. Newcastle. Mm-hmm. So Newcastle nurse ends up financially free. Tell us the story. I was looking for something to supplement my income yeah. when I found out I was pregnant with twins. So, so you, was... had, you, had, you had two kids and then you found out you had twins. And yes. You were like, oh my gosh, I need... Okay. Yeah, I need to earn some more money here. Yeah. So I was open to something, but I just didn't know what it was. And last October, we got my husband's pension statement for what the forecast when he retires at 65, and it was less than £100 a month. Right. And that was something you'd been paying into for 20 years. Oh. And we were like, that's it? Okay, we need to definitely, definitely do something here. And then last October, out of the blue, exactly what happened when I thought I wanted to be a nurse. I just woke up one day and wanted to be a property investor. Wow, so you just had the urge to yeah. be a property investor. And I knew and nothing whatsoever. And you were a full-time nurse, your husband's pension's rubbish, <laughs> you're both working for crazy hours, <laughs> you've got four kids now. Did you have four kids already? Yes, I yeah. had them in the June. Yeah. So you've now got four yeah. kids and you haven't got any money, right? No. So you're a bit skint. Mm-hmm. So then you want to be a property investor, but you've got no money, so what happened? I then started looking on YouTube yeah. and looked at a number of people and then I came across Samuel Leeds. The legend. And you stuck. Oh, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, I just okay. liked you. I just yeah. liked your energy, your spirit, the way you explain things on the YouTube videos. Yeah. It was brilliant. I really appreciate that. It's a real honour co- coming from you. So you then came on the crash course. Mm-hmm. And yeah. how, was that? How, was those, how was those two days? Well, I just thought I'd come along to the crash course and that would be that. Yeah. Um, I remember coming in and feeling quite nervous and I didn't know what would happen or you know, would anybody speak to me? What, was, what would happen? Yeah. Uh, and I just remember I came up on the first day and said, could I shake your hand? Because I wanted to thank you for changing my life. How, how would I shake your And I thought that would be it. Because I was then on the, I was already on my way. I came to the crash course at the end of February and I'd already remortgaged the house to become a property investor. Oh, okay. Uh, and had two deals going through. Oh wow, so you had two deals going through and you mm-hmm. refinanced that literally just off the back of my yeah. book and my YouTube video yeah. videos. So you literally came to the crash course just to thank me mm-hmm. um, for what happened. And what did I say, what happened then? Uh, and then we went through the two days, it was brilliant. Yeah, and, and you were on stage. Oh, you got really, yeah. Well, you told us not to use our phones, yeah. and so we had them switched off, and then Russell kept pinging, a message from Russell kept pinging, come and see me at the side of the room, come and see me at the side yeah. of the room, and I'm thinking, I'm not supposed to be looking at my phone, what am I gonna do here? <laughs> and then I went in the break, and I went to see Russell at the side of the room, and he wanted me to join the academy, yeah. and then you came over. Because your energy at the crash course, I, you, I know you're quite a shy person, or at least, at least you say so, but your, your energy at the crash course, you were this bubbly yeah. northern lady 
who was, you know, really getting into it and we really liked you. We knew that you were an action taker because you'd already refinanced your house and you've got a couple of deals on the table. And we thought, you know what, we really need to support you. We need to see the deals. Yeah. This is going to be a journey together. I, I had some big plans for you. Mm. Um, so, so that's why we approached you about the Property Investors Academy. Yes. Which you joined. Which I joined. How did you pay for the academy? Because I, I mean, you didn't have any money, right? So how did that happen? No. Uh, well, I wasn't ready at that point to join the academy because I'd, got, I'd literally bought two houses with that money that I got. And but there was no that. there was no more money to yeah. pay for the academy. So I'm paying for my non installments Because the first yeah. is more about person mm-hmm. than who's got the money to pay for the training. Yes. We saw something in you that was that was really precious and we knew that we could work with you and you could be successful. So we worked something out, right? Yeah. Installments and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, which is cool. Okay. So you joined the academy mm-hmm. off the back of the crash course, you've got these two deals going through. Tell us what happened next because it's, it's quite a story. Oh, it's been quite the journey, hasn't it? And you've ended up doing all yeah. kinds of things. You've had dinner with Robert Kiyosaki. I have, yes. You've come out and helped us with our Uganda Africa um, projects. Mm-hmm. You've mm-hmm. Um, got multiple deals that, that have gone through. You're now not working anymore? No. When did you last, no. when did you last work as a nurse? 15th of April, 2018. 15th of April. So you literally went from... What, sorry, was it February when we met? The crash so I met, you in, I met you in Manchester at the end of February at the crash course. So February. Joined the academy on the 19th of March. Yeah. Officially. And then, yeah. and then you were financially free within four weeks. Yes. Of the crash course. Yes. Because those two deals came off. Yeah. That were really good deals. Mm-hmm. What were the deals? Well, one deal fell through. Yeah. Discipline your disappointment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As these things happen. Uh, so one deal fell through, but I, I was still financially free off one deal. Actually, free off one deal. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. Because the thing is, Anne, although that deal wasn't making you like thousands and thousands a month, mm-hmm. it was enough to replace your income. It was, and that was life changing because it then took you, the pressure off. How much money did you have work. to put into the deal? I put in 25% of for deposit. Yeah. And then all the legal fees and stamp duty. So how much was that roughly? Roughly about 21, 22, 23, probably about 24,000. So you put mm. in about how much? So 23, 24,000? About 24,000, yeah. 24,000. And how much are you making profit after your mortgage payments, your management, all that stuff on that property? 800 pounds. 800 pounds? Yes. Which might not sound like a massive amount of money to some people, but that was enough for you to then do what? That was enough for me to stop working. How was it? It's crazy that that wasn't a feed to stop working. Yeah. Because the definition of financial freedom is not having loads of money, having a private jet. The definition of financial freedom is when your passive income, which Mm -hmm. might only be 800 pounds, is enough to cover your living expenses. Yes. And that replaced your income as a nurse, Mm -hmm. which is insane really, Mm because you were working so hard as a nurse. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you quit working. I know technically you're a subcontractor. Yes, so I went back to work after maternity two days a week, so that's why it replaced yeah. my income but then, fully. But then, you then, hey, what are you doing at the moment? I'm on the nurse bank, yeah. and it's up to me whether I go to work or I don't go to but work. you haven't been to work since April. So what do you do on a day-to-day basis? Uh, 24-7 property investor. 24-7 yeah. property investor, high five, that's so cool. <laughs> so Anne, what do you think about Anne? So I, I love Anne's story. I mean, I, I remember when she first came to... I remember when she first came to the crash course, and she's one of those people. She's uh, an infectious, um, infectious in terms of her, her passionate, and she's very excitable, and she gets into stuff. And do you know, <coughs> we talked a few weeks ago about people being committed. Yeah, Anne is one of the most committed people. Do you know what I love about Anne? Go on. Is she is annoyingly sort of driven, which is great. And I, I don't mean I mean annoyingly in a loving way. I don't could mean we, it in a horrible way. Could we way. like edit that and send it to Anne and just go? Do you know what I love about Anne? She's annoying. And no, then just cut, no, cut no, the no, no. And everything. She's annoyingly yeah, driven in the it. sense of she just she just keeps going, which is phenomenal. And I I really do like Anne. Uh, she came to Uganda with us. She did. Um, and do you know what's funny? I remember, right? Do you know after we had that horrific accident in uh, Uganda, uh, Anne obviously because of our, um, she couldn't come down the water, the waterfall, so she went in the safety boat and she came down and she went down the, the softer routes. Now, uh, me oh, and Sam would have gone the safety boat. Yeah, <laughs> uh, me and Anna, we ended up getting dragged down the river a little while. It took them a little while to find us, but the boat that found us, Anne was in the boat, um, and me and Anna got dragged into this boat, right? 
and then we were a bit shaken up and a bit like wow what the heck just happened bruised there? bleeding yeah, yeah. injured and I, i'll always remember this Anne, and i love you for it Anne went she picked her glasses I, I didn't have my glasses on but her glasses were a bit wet and she got a bit of water on her trousers and she goes oh my glasses fell off there and i nearly fell in the water and it's like are you serious Anne? we've just been dragged out the nile and you're moaning about wet trousers and your glasses falling off it's like <laughs> I must admit, me and Anna both wanted to push her in. <laughs> we wouldn't have, though, Anne. We Pull the glasses off and throw them on the floor. <laughs> I I'll show remember. your glasses nearly falling off. <laughs> I always remember that. That will stick me forever. I thought it was hilarious. Oh, my um, glasses nearly fell off. I know. <laughs> that was terrible. I know it was. My glasses nearly fell off. <laughs> that wasn't terrible. Yeah. Anyway, back to Anne. So Anne, is off, she's investing in Middlesbrough. Yep. She's also got some rent to rent service accommodation. She lives in Middlesbrough, doesn't she? No, no, she lives um, just, I'm just north. Winding her, I'm just Newcastle. winding her up if she's listening. Okay. Because we, we, always, we always pretend that she lives in Middlesbrough and she hates it. Oh, does she? Yeah. <laughs> um, but so yeah, next she's... time you see her, just go, you're from Middlesbrough, aren't you? Huh? <laughs> she lives, um, I think, just north of Newcastle in the. Uh, I don't know, I don't know exactly where, but north I don't of know New... where she She's lives. got a Newcastle accent, so. She lives somewhere, somewhere up there. Um, but yeah, she's lovely. She's like an aunt. Do you not think? She never gives up. She never gives up. Mm. She's been told no more times than most of us have. Um, and she's like, no, okay, I'll move to somebody else. And she goes on to somebody else. For anyone that hasn't heard Samuel's aunt story, do you yeah. want to clear up what you mean by she's like an aunt? Because it might that might be right, seen okay. as offensive. Can you do it? Because I probably can't remember it. Go on, I want to hear you All do right, it. Okay, so the aunt, essentially, so say this is an obstacle. The aunt will come round it and go round it, go under it, go over it. Well, if, they're, if they're listening, by the way, he just, if, he's okay, pointing at fine, a mug. I'm pointing at a cup and <laughs> I've put a cup down and I've said, said, say that is a massive obstacle in your journey, whatever. Now, most people will see the obstacle and they'll stand staring at it for ages and think, oh, how am I going to get over that? Anne is like the ant. The ant will go under the ground, it will bury, it will scourge its way through the ground, it will climb over it, go round it, go through it if it has to, to mm. get to what it wants. And that's what I mean when I say Anne is like the ant, in the most loving way possible. Yeah. Like where she couldn't get a mortgage. Yes, 100%. She couldn't get a mortgage. No mortgage broker. She just kept going, kept trying different mortgage brokers and, until eventually. The thing is, what Anne's good at... <laughs> bless you. Thank you. Um, Did you say bless you when someone coughs? No, I didn't think so. Did you have a bit of a coffee waffy? <laughs> uh, the, the thing there, right, with Anne, do you know what? She's really good at discipline or disappointment. Mm. Um, and that's one thing Samuel teaches a lot. Discipline your disappointment, but celebrate your success and go crazy when you get success because when you get success, it's awesome. She's tried everything as well, hasn't she? She's gone single yeah. there. She's, gone, she's been very, di you know, very diverse in her strategy. And remember, guys, she is doing all of this She's now obviously uh, quit her full-time job, but she was doing a lot of this while she was working full-time, looking after four children. Mm. So what's your excuses, guys? And a nurse isn't exactly an easy job. No, she has a very hard job. Very hard job. Oh, can you imagine looking after four children? Mate, it would drive me potty. <laughs> it would drive me nuts. Could you do it? No. Nah. Uh, listen, on a serious note, uh, I don't know about you, you, with, uh, you, you and your kids, um, but certainly when, when my youngest was growing up uh, and things like that, and she was quite young, I used to go to work to get a break. <laughs> yeah. I'm not ashamed to admit that um, because being a mother is hard. Hard. And all mothers deserve a praise. That was you. before the op. <laughs> 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 oh, you're funny. Not. Being a father's hard too. Being a father's hard, yeah. No, um, I agree with you. Not as hard as being a mother though, I don't think. Well, it depends on what role you take on, but yeah, I know what you mean. You sexist well, pig. Well, uh, no, 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 hang about, hang about. <laughs> <laughs> you told me earlier all you do around your house is walk the dog. Come that wasn't on. earlier. It was last week. Or last week, whatever. Uh, all you do is walk the dog. Yeah. Um, so that means Anna is doing everything. That poor woman. Yeah, but You've I'm got her looking after the children, picking up after you, doing everything. No. She probably cooks your meals for you and everything. Oh, no, hang about. You've got a maid that does that, haven't you? Oh. <laughs> I don't have a maid. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> what What is he like? Uh, that's funny. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. What, what, Just what winding him like? up. Um, no, I agree with you there. Yeah. Uh, if, if if Anna, I mean, I'm quite hands on with the kids, but Anna's the responsible one. Yeah. I think I think you've got to have that. With whatever you do, you have someone because if you, if you've got two people that are responsible for it, it either gets done twice or it doesn't get done at all. So would you say like, it's like with with me and Lisa, um, perhaps one of us is more like the fun person. One of them, one of us is more like the not disciplinarian, but the the let's get things done. Which are you? I can't see you as either. 
I'm, I'm <laughs> no, I must admit, I'm not the, I'm not overly the fun person, but um, I'm more of the just don't worry about it. Let's just do whatever. The chilled out person. I'm more of the chilled out person, whereas Lisa's more about no, we need to get, we've got routines and all that sort of stuff. Um, what, what, oh, so what, he was seeing himself as the fun person. I, I wouldn't say fun, but <laughs> no, I chilled wouldn't. out, chilled out. <laughs> um, so, what part of the relationship do you play? I'm, and. They listen to Anna more than they listen to me. Yeah, same as <laughs> same as with my kids. So, uh, yeah. Apart, I wouldn't from- say I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I was the. Oh, I don't know. I wouldn't say I was like really soft. Yeah, but um, I probably am softer. Yeah. I probably am softer than Anna. They're only kids once, aren't they? But anyway, yeah. I mean, Anne's doing this all of this with four kids, full time job. She's now obviously uh, left a full time job. She, I think she's. Uh, working as and when she chooses to not because she has to yeah um but it is her journey's been awesome she's had ups she's has downs but she just keeps plugging along no fantastic absolutely brilliant right it's now time for this it's property investing news time Right, so it's time for the news. Uh, before we get started in the news, if you're listening to this on, 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 if you're just listening to this, ignore what I'm about to say. If you're watching on YouTube, we have just reshuffled the mics around. Um, Alistair went to Jelly's hair for about and an hour, and we decided to mess <laughs> around with the mics. So they got bored when I was out. Yeah, have you got uh, a bit of eyeshadow that one as well. Uh, yes, a, a bit of eyeshadow. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. So uh, this week's not. news, we're going to reveal which UK city has got the highest house price growth mm-hmm. uh, in the UK. It's actually had the highest, ev- well, not every year, but five out of the last six years. I bet I can guess where it is. Well, I've told you where it is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a guess. No, but I bet it won't be a shock to many people. Okay, well, well, we'll wait and see. The place is... That was, that, was a, that was a very bad drum roll. Go. Manchester. It is Manchester. So uh, Manchester is seriously on the on the up at the moment. And the, the predictions are it's going to rise, and even though it's been growing really quickly it's going to rise another 57 percent by 2028 i can definitely see that um every time i go to manchester it seems there's new buildings going up um and i know in manchester city center there's a lot of sort of disused buildings getting converted into apartments and there's a a lot of apartment buildings going up yep so i'll just read a little bit of the article to give you guys an idea what, what we're looking at here so with one of europe's fastest growing economies that's pretty yeah uh, Manchester saw significant numbers in 2017 as the average house price rose by 11%. It's pretty good. Um, yeah, well, the UK average is five. So it's more than double the, the UK average. Um, in the 12 months to June 2018, Manchester rose by 9%. So really, it's growing almost what well, it's 10%, 10% a year. It's good. Uh, London saw a 1% fall, uh, and that has added to Manchester boasting the highest price growth in the uk property market at five of the last six years uh now when i told you this you were like yeah i'm not surprised at all so tell us a bit about your experience in manchester and why this doesn't surprise you it, purely because the amount of development that's been going on there and and manchester seems to be like they've, they've cleaned manchester up a lot in the last uh five six years i mean i i went to manchester about 15 years ago and i remember thinking it was a bit of a dump to be honest manchester um, yeah um I, when i when I in my previous industry, I used to uh, walk around the country, and I used to go up there and work now and again. And I never enjoyed going to Manchester. But actually, there's been a lot of development. There's been a lot of new stuff going on, a lot of uh, regeneration, all that sort of stuff. And Manchester city centre is lovely. Mm. Um, there's lots of really nice buildings in Manchester, and there's apartment blocks going up left, right, and centre. Um, so it, it, there's a lot going on in Manchester. It's now like the the, the sort of city apart from London, isn't it? Manchester seen as that, and there's a lot of like big companies. Not going Birmingham. There. Uh, maybe Birmingham as well as and sort of tied in the same line, I suppose. Birmingham but second city and all. Yeah. See, uh, where would you rather live, Birmingham or Manchester? Oh, good question. If well, yeah. if I was going to move today, if you're going to move today, I'd and go to some Birmingham. D- Why? Because I live near Birmingham now. Yeah, but that's just like saying I'm going to buy a house where I live. Like, well, no, it's not. Because you said where would you want to move? No, I if don't want to move somewhere, and it was Birmingham or Manchester. I would choose Manchester. Would you? Yeah. It's miles away. Yeah, but it doesn't matter about that. Forget if just Manchester's just. I've nice got place. like friends and a life and ah, uh, yeah, okay, for you, I can see, I can <laughs> see it. I can. Why is that, Ross? <laughs> what I can just, I can just, I can just see it now. I can see it now. Uh, would you really want to move to? Why would you want to move to Manchester? Um, just because whenever I've been out there, I've uh, and I've like it's been a good night out. I've enjoyed it, and there's lots going on there. There's nice mm, shopping centres. Good there's, night, there's, good there's, night out. 
Yeah, good night. <laughs> 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 um, whereas I can't say necessarily the same for Birmingham. Um, Birmingham is I'm on not the up. I'm sure it is on the up, but to be honest, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I went to a, a book signing in Birmingham, and I'm not going to lie, it was not the best experience in my life. I think you're lying. No, I'm not. I, I just said I wasn't going to lie. Um, I, I do think it was the best experience in my life. The worst experience in my life. <laughs> Hold on a second. Hold on. This, no, 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 no. So you went to a book signing and it was the worst Mate, experience in your life. I was queuing outside W. This guy Smith. has not had many bad experiences. Oh, Seri- listen, listen, it was a disaster. It I had was to queue. I it was, was in a cold. City. It was cold. It was raining. Hold on. And I was standing in a queue. Mate. I was standing in this queue seriously right. to do a book signing on a Sunday afternoon. Oh, and how tough for you? Maybe I'm being a bit judgmental, but it was like standing in the queue for the freaking show of Jerry Mikhail. It was a nightmare. Honestly, mate, honestly. But I can't judge the whole city on that queue, so I'm sure Birmingham is Birmingham is good. Uh, we're actually going out in Birmingham next week. I don't know if you're coming. You weren't invited, but uh, I'm sure everyone else is coming. I, I, I'm in India. You're in India, yeah. You're no. going on the 8th, aren't you? Uh, we're going on the 8th, yeah. yeah. It's a yeah. shame because I would like, I would uh, enjoy to spend some more time with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, see, uh, see your dad dancing moves. Uh, mate, my <laughs> dancing moves are, are pretty awesome. A pretty, or may, maybe, maybe I'll do some on the show one day. Okay. What, on the the, uh, the podcast? On the podcast, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I wouldn't, do it, I wouldn't do it on a YouTube show because everyone would see. <laughs> I'll just do it on the, I'll just do it on the, re, on the, on, uh, we'll, we'll sc- cut it from YouTube. We'll just put it on the, uh, on the podcast. Just put it on the podcast. Dancing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so what's the article saying about Manchester? All right. We're just waffling it on says, about. It uh, says, Manchester's future is bright. The future continues to look positive for Manchester. Um, house prices expect to rise 57% by the end of 2028. Uh, this is the highest among all the top UK cities and shows property investment in the city is likely to be extremely mm. lucrative. Additional research and reports have concluded similar findings. So it's not just one report, it's a lot of people. So yeah. recent reports <coughs> from Savills. Um, Savills, though, have said the north of England and the West Midlands are likely to keep growing strongly for the next five years. See, I... I think you can throw... I mean, I know it's not about Birmingham at all, but I think you could throw Birmingham in the mix. Birmingham's definitely on the up, 100%. 100%. There's there's a lot lot going on in Birmingham as well. Um, There's a lot of development. There is a lot of development. And city centre as well. There's lots of cranes up in there. There's there's loads and loads of stuff going on. In Birmingham, yeah. yeah, yeah, And and some of the buildings in Birmingham are like like spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look at the ball ring. Yeah, yeah. Ball ring's amazing. You've got places like Brinley Place, the mm-hmm. Jewelry Quarter. Yeah. You, I went to play Ghetto Golf the other day. Okay. Um, and it was in a place, centre of Birmingham. Oh, what's it called? Digbuff. See, Nick, I mean, no, Nick knows his Birmingham. Digbuff and Digbuff. Have you ever been? To Digbuff? Yeah. No. It is unlike anywhere I've ever been is before. Okay. You, Nick it's just got a, it's Nick, got a sucky name. Like Digbeth. What sort of name's that? Well, someone that's married to Beth might dig Beth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, but um, it was, what, it, it was quick-witted for you. Well, it's, um, it's such a strange place. It's like one minute, it's all graffiti. It, it literally it felt like I was in another country. Okay. It was, you know, I, like, I imagine some of the... Very, it was very trendy, but it was very. It had like canals, and it was. Uh, it's tr- you, you should, if you get a chance, go do you know, to do you know what scarred me with Birmingham? Let do me guess. Do you mem- no, no, a no, book no, signing. No, we had to walk past no, W. H. Smith. No. Do you remember about three months ago? You asked me to go and do a viewing for you in a city centre apartment. Yeah, and you did, I don't know if I ever told you about this. You did. You said it was horrible. It was a dump, and uh, I have. Uh, you didn't even get in the apartment. I didn't get in the apartment. I didn't want to go in the apartment, and um, but I parked in the car park, and it was just a dump, mate. It was like being in. Well, mate, like, it was like being in the uh, the, the Gorbals in Glasgow in the seventies and eighties. I don't compare it to Scotland, mate. That's it was. Not fair. That's I'm just telling not you, fair. there was rubbish everywhere. There was abandoned cars. I'm sure I saw somebody getting mugged as well, but. <laughs> <laughs> that was just at this place. He just filmed it on his phone. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, no, no. No, but, okay, Manchester. Manchester's good. Yeah. And I know HMOs work, work very well in Manchester, but obviously there is there is. Well, Manchester, I mean, Manchester obviously is, is doing better than London. What do you make of London falling? Well, I mean, it's sort of, it's not, it's not that's not news, is it? It's been like that for some time now, hasn't it? Uh, London's had its expansion. It's now sort of levelling off a little bit. Yeah. Um, but bear crazy. in mind, a 1% price drop in London is like quite big. 
one percent is like you know a hundred grand no. yeah <laughs> well it is in reality like one percent nah. in middlesbrough is like 50 quid <laughs> but down in london it's probably a bit of, it's probably a chunk of money isn't it yeah so um it's all relative i suppose but yeah i mean london i've got a feeling you you your big cities outside of london yeah. A serious. I mean, obviously, Manchester and Birmingham are the, are the big two, but I've got a feeling they're going to be really on the really smart places to invest. Yeah, yeah. Very well, smart um, places to invest. I, I know it's not probably on topic, but what do you think about Sheffield? What as a place? Well, as as an up and coming place, do you think that's going to be up and coming, or do you think it's? I don't know Sheffield to be honest. Okay. I know Samuel's being dumped there. Oh yeah, that's we went in his FF talent, didn't he? Yeah, that's cool. So um, no, no, it's just I w- I've been up there. Um, a lot in the last sort of six months and like young John Raybould he lives there and he, he, he rates the place he loves it uh, it is quite the city centre is quite nice but I'm just curious to all other cities which you think are uh, on what, the up what about um, places like Leeds yeah hey, Leeds is uh, I went there last day New Year's Eve actually well, while you talk a bit let me see if I can find the other cities so. okay well um, yeah Leeds is good like I say a lot of regeneration there. and also one of the best restaurants in the country are in Leeds place called Fazenda. But Beautiful, mate. Is it? Is it Brazilian? I think Argentinian or Brazilian, one of them. Like, they're the same. But anyway, Argentinian <laughs> or Brazilian. Um, the, um, yeah, it's like a, a proper, like, steakhouse, meat, meat house, just as much meat as you want. And they carve it off you on your plate for you. Uh, it's beautiful. Do they really around really nice. with big skewers? Yeah, big massive skewer. And they say, do you want some fillets? Or? And they just carve it off. All you can eat. Ironically... Uh, that was the first place I've ever ever tried lamb, and it was the nicest lamb I've ever had. Well, of course it was. It was the first, first yeah, but place I, you'd ever no, no, tried no. it. I, I, I always first thought lamb, time I ever tried it, it was the nicest one I've, I ever had. Oh, but I've not had it since because I've, that, it, it's, I loved it there, but I've not been liked it back because lamb's very fatty. So oh, hold on, you've never. It was the first time you ever tried yep. it, and I've not had it. I've had it since. Oh, but hold on, hold on. So <laughs> sorry, let me just get this straight. So it was the first time you ever tried it. Yeah. It was the nicest lamb you'd ever had, yeah. which is obvious because it's the first time you'd ever tried it. Yeah. And you've never had it again since no, because it's I've, normally too fatty. I've had it since, but it was too fatty. So okay. I'm going to have to go back to Fazenda. Fazenda. So next time I'm in Leeds, I'm going to Fazenda. Nice. So anyway, back on topic. The internet's not working, so we'll have to just guess. Okay, so where? what other cities? Nick, come on, name a city. Grimsby. Grimsby. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, isn't it, when someone says to you, name a city. You forget, don't and you? you? forget all the city. I mean, you could just... He could have said anything. Blank. He's just like... He literally, this was his face. <laughs> Grimsby. <laughs> <laughs> he just froze. Nottingham. Is Nottingham on the up? Nottingham's a city, and it's also... Very, Nottingham, I think, is going to be but on the even, up. Even little places like Warsaw. Yeah. Right. They're doing some serious development in Warsaw Are right they? now. On, on, on not the town centre, town centre... But on the outskirts of the town centre, the building like, um, you know, um, uh, you know, like shopping mall type things okay. and hotels. So like retail park type retail things. Retail parks yeah, yeah. with like food places. Well, that comes back to the whole um, high street style. I think they're mm. all going out of town uh, to retail parks. Um, and like most retail parks now have got restaurants because the people make a whole like a morning of it or a lunch. Yeah, lunch cinemas. There's cinemas a cinema there, there now, new cinema. Yeah. They're building a new travel lodge. They're really, you know, going to they're town. Going to town it? Yeah. But I think... I think if you're going to invest and you're looking for capital appreciation, Manchester's obviously a good shout. But mm-hmm. have a look at the, have a look at the different cities. I mean, if you've got a bit of internet, which I obviously don't at the moment, <laughs> have a look at the different cities and, and see. But but it, you know you can't lie, is, you can't go against the stats. It's also worth trying to work out where Manchester was say a few years ago, and see if you can um, sort of associate that with any other cities, and see mm. if you can see look like Sheffield's where Manchester was. Like three, four years ago, and invest in Sheffield. Manchester's very you know big. I mean? Maybe where's big? Maybe someone out Newcastle. Maybe. Yeah, I've only been there a few times. I've, I can't say I know Newcastle apart from that big, like the Bridge of the North or whatever it is. Angel of the North, not Bridge of the North. <laughs> Angel of the North. That's the only thing I know in Newcastle. Yeah, I've been to Newcastle. It's all right. And and the other thing I know about Newcastle is that they don't seem to feel the cold, because whenever I've been out in Newcastle, like they don't seem to wear a lot of clothes and they don't feel the cold. Whereas I'm out in my uh, big jacket. Well, since when have you become a southern softer? I don't know, man. I've been southernized. Seriously, I have been proper southernized. Um, Tell them they need to work on your accent. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, um, because it's, that's the only thing. Yeah. yeah. No, when I was up north, obviously, when I was in Scotland, I didn't mind the cold. We come down here in shorts, man. Now I have, I, I just feel the cold so much. Maybe it's the age. Maybe, maybe. 
In fact, I'll probably put it down to that. The oh, age. I'm sure you will. The age. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, well, there you go. So we'll leave you with that. Manchester is the place to invest if you want good capital appreciation. Hope you enjoyed this week's show. Don't forget, we're back here every single Friday at four o'clock. Absolutely. So please join us next week. Also, please subscribe and share with all your friends. My name is Russell Leeds. I'm Alistair Cunningham. And we will see you next week. See you later, guys. Bye.